So good afternoon to one and all. Uh, I am Dr. Suresh, consultant pediatrician, pulmonologist, neurology specialist from Rainbow Children's Hospital, Chennai. At the outset, I I am I am sorry for uh, this uh, small technical issues. I request all of you to mute your uh, audio so that uh, the session will go without any uninterrupted issues. Uh, you can put your uh, queries in the chat box or you can ask your queries at the end of the discussion also. So today's topic is arctic area and angioedema in children, a practical approach. Arctic area is a common pediatric problem which we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, you all agree with me, the incidence of arctic area is increasing dramatically. Uh, both the acute articular cases and chronic articular cases, which we are seeing in our practice, is increasing uh, of uh, recent onset. Um, and uh, today, I'm going to discuss this topic in the next 45 minutes. I'm going to briefly discuss with you all about the definitions, classification of arctic area, etiopathogenesis, and management strategies one should follow when a child presents with acute or chronic arctic area. And I'm going to briefly discuss about hereditary angioedema also. Uh, about in all these things, I'm going to discuss with case scenario based approach. So let's start with the case. Here we have a three year old girl baby brought with concerns of itchy hives involving all over the body of five days duration. There was no history of angioedema, no history of fever or bees. And clinically, apart from the rashes, the child is otherwise fine. The vitals were normal. The uh, treating pediatrician initially started the child with hydroxyzine. With this, there is a prompt response and the child improved transiently. However, the child started getting the rashes again and again. Hence, there is a concern and this child was referred. So what's your diagnosis here? We all know we are dealing with the case of acute arctic area. So arctic area by definition is occurrence of either wheels or angioedema or both. So either a wheel or angioedema in a presence in a child signifies the definition of arctic area. And when the arctic area lasts for a duration of more than six weeks or less than six weeks, it is known as acute arctic area. So what is a wheel? What is an angioedema? This is a basic definition one should understand. Wheel is nothing but a diffuse erythematous plague. It is a diffuse erythematous plague with a central swelling and a surrounding flare. Central swelling and a surrounding flare. It is characteristically associated with itching and burning sensation and it usually lasts for less than 24 hours. This is because the pathology in the wheel is more superficial. It involves predominantly the upper dermis. In contrast, angioedema involves only specific sites. It involves either the eyelids, the lips, tongue, genitalia, hands, etc. Here, in contrast to the wheels, the pain is the predominant symptom rather than the itch. And it tends to last for longer duration. Usually it lasts up to 72 hours. This is because the pathology in angioedema is little deep. Here the pathology lies in the lower part of the dermis or even extend up to the subcutaneous tissue. So coming back to the case, so here we are dealing with a child, three-year-old baby with she wheels lasting for five days duration, no angioedema. So by definition, it is less than six weeks, so it is acute arctic area, not responding to the antics. So what are we going to deal with it? Are we going to do any investigations? What investigations would you order at this point of time? The blood counts, CRP, ESR, a urine analysis, allergy skin testing, or all of the above or none of the above. Uh, the point here one should understand is acute arctic area doesn't require any investigations at all. This is because in acute arctic area is because, usually because of viral apparatus infections, or it can happen because of drugs, or because of some foods such as meat, meat seed foods, insect bites, and sometimes it may be idiopathy. So generally, we don't require any investigation at the point of time. So what to treat, how to treat the child? Already the child has received attracts, that is hydroxyzine. So what else we are going to add for this child? Whether we can add attracts lotion or attracts, in addition to this, we will give a prednisolone or whether we can change the antihistamine to levocetrazin or whether we can change it to levocetrazin or prednisolone. What to do? To answer this question, 
we should know the natural course of atrophic area in general and with the acute atrophic area recovery is the rule usually spontaneous resolution will happen whether we treat or not so only supported treatment is very very important and this is very important statement that is second generation antihistamines are the key drugs in of choice in the management of acute atrophic area the second generation antihistamines include cetirizine levocetirizine fexofenadine belastin all these drugs and one should always avoid first generation antihistamines such as hydroxyzine diphenhydramine and chlorpheniramine etc this is because in older children usually drowsiness will happen because these first generation antihistamines tend to cross the blood brain barrier and causes drowsiness sometimes in infants it causes paradoxical irritability also in addition to this children also experiences some anticholinergic side effects such as urinary retention dryness of mouth etc and the second important point is there is no role for topical antihistamines in acute area there is no role of steroids yet the common tendency is when a child is not responding to antihistamines we tend to add the steroids steroids are indicated in acute atrophic area only when there is an angioedema is there otherwise you give steroids there is a temporary solution resolution of the symptoms to be there again the child will be getting the rashes so uh, the point what all we learned in the first case is acute atrophic area is a self limiting condition it usually uh, recover within 6 weeks itself and no investigations is required in the case management treatment is only second generation antihistamines there is no role for first generation antihistamines there is no role of topical antihistamines there is no role for steroids unless the child has proceeded angioedema coming to the case here we have a 5 year old boy present with atrophic area involving 30 to 40 wheels per day for 10 days here the child's lesions are staying for longer time they stay in the same place for nearly 72 hours and while disappearing there is a black discoloration and the child also continues to have on and off high fever spikes and arthralgia is there so what's the diagnosis in this case compared to the previous case if you could closely see there are little differences there here the duration is less than 6 months 6 weeks so we are dealing with a case of acute atrophic area but what is the difference here the lesions tends to stay for longer duration i told wheels usually settle down in 24 hours so here it is lasting for 72 hours and it also leaves a black discoloration the systemic symptoms is also there so what's the diagnosis this is not a simple case of acute atrophic area this is a case of acute atrophic area vasculitis so one should suspect acute atrophic area vasculitis whenever the atrophic area rashes are painful or palpable and lasting for more than 24 hours associated with systemic symptoms here the cause is maybe connective tissue disorder like sle maybe a drug reaction maybe malignancy maybe some chronic infections also sometimes it may be idiopathic so whenever we deal a child with acute atrophic area vasculitis we should go for investigations which includes a blood count as a c reactive protein esr complement levels if you have suspicion of sle skin biopsy if you want to prove a leukocytic vasculitis ANA and bone marrow if indicated based on the case scenario. So a word of caution here is not all children presenting with wheels or angioedema is atrophic area. This is because sometimes there is a condition known as atrophic area pigmentosa, so also known as systemic mastocytosis, which can also present only with atrophic area. And similarly, there are various syndromes such as Meckel-Weil syndrome, Sinsa syndrome, Glitz syndrome. All these syndromes. can present with atrophic area but they have a systemic features so the point one should always be very careful is whenever we are dealing with atrophic area is the duration is less than 6 weeks and the lesions lasting less than 24 hours is very important and is there any systemic features present or not if there is no systemic features no need to work up for an acute atrophic area let's move on to the next case case 3 and case 4 here we have on the left side we have a 4 year old girl presenting with recurrent episodes of atrophic area for 3 months duration here the duration is 3 months that is more than 6 weeks lesions last approximate 10 to 15 per day the wheels have pruritus and they respond to montelukast once a patient stops montelukast and cetirizine the lesions happens we see a lot of patients in our practice like this there is no history of wheels allergic rhinitis no specific relationship to any food on the right side we have a very similar presentation the age group same and the, but the duration is almost 3 years child is suffering from this rashes almost 3 years and tend to get more than 50 rashes per day it's and pruritus is very severe other than this this child also requires daily montelukast and cetirizine to have a symptom free period 
and there is no history of weeks allergic rhinitis. So what is the diagnosis for this left side case and what is the diagnosis for the right side case? So for which we should know the basic definition and the classification. So already I told acute urtic area means urtic area lasting for less than six weeks. Now what is chronic urtic area? Chronic urtic area is uh, defined as urtic area which lasts for more than six weeks. Chronic urtic area can be classified into two types. One is the spontaneous variety. Here there is no external trigger will be there, which is the most common constitutes almost 80% of chronic urtic area. And the second one is the inducible one, which constitutes approximately 20% of the cases of chronic urtic area. So how to class, how to see the severity? So severity, this, we see three, four patients with chronic urtic area, which is mild, which is moderate, which is severe. There is a score known as urtic area activity score, UAS7 score. It takes an account of two things. One is the wheel numbers and the severity of pruritus. It gives a score of 0, 1, 2, 3 based on the number of wheels. Less than 20 wheels means score of 1. 20 to 50 wheels per day means score of 2. More than 50 wheels per day means score of 3. Similarly, mild pruritus is score of 1. And moderate, which is troublesome, not disturbs the quality of life, score of 2. And intense pruritus, which disturbs the quality of life, is score of 3. Children with chronic urtic area should always be given this scoring system. And every day, they'll be having a score maximum between 0 to 6. They have to note down the score every week. So a weekly score can range between 0 to 42. This is an important score which will help us to classify the disease. So coming to the case back again, we have here the case 3 and case 4. The left side, we have an arctic area which is lasting for more than 6 weeks, 10 to 15 rashes, and pruritus is just present. So here we are dealing with a child of chronic spontaneous arctic area and there is no, as there is no trigger, and the lesions are less, only less than 20 and there is only just pruritus is present. It is a mild chronic spontaneous urtic area. On the right side, we have a child who has more than 50 rashes per day and who has severe pruritus is present and duration of the urtic area is more than six weeks and there is no trigger. So we are dealing with the chronic spontaneous urtic area severe type. So coming to the case five, here we have a 10 year old boy who complaints of urtic area compared to the previous cases it is not here urtic area is not happening daily he gets urtic area whenever he takes bath in cold water otherwise he doesn't have an urtic area so we try to simulate by putting an ice box over his hand and look for the response we got a urtic area immediately in the area of application of ice box so this is known as chronic induced urtic area so we have a trigger external trigger and based on this child gets rashes so the trigger induced urtic area, this is known as chronic inducible urtic area, also known as cold urtic area. One type of chronic inducible urtic area is cold urtic area. So to re reinforce again, chronic urtic area can be classified into spontaneous and inducible. Inducible urtic area is because of some triggers. As in the previous case, we have a cold urtic area. Some children may get urtic area only on exposure to hot water. They are known as heat urtic area. Some children, when they expose to sunlight, they get urtic area. This is known as solar urtic area. Some school children goes to school by putting a backpack and coming back home, they develop urtic area in the area of pressure. This is known as pressure urtic area. Some children, while playing, they'll get urtic area. This is known as cold allergic urtic area. All these constitutes the chronic inducible urtic area type. So whenever we see a child with urtic area, the more important first question is, is the wheels duration? That is acute or chronic, you can do it off. And whether it lasts for how many hours per day and leaves any discoloration, systemic symptoms, and more important triggers, any food, exercise, drug use, and there is, is there a family history of atopy or any medical history of allergies is there or not, we should be obtained. And after the history, if we suspect any history of dermatographism, which is a type of inducible urtic area, we can demonstrate dermatographism. And if there is a suspicion of cold urtic area or hot urtic area by putting ice cubes or hot water, we can see whether urtic area is developing or not. So systemic examination in general, in general, chronic urtic area will not yield anything. Usually it will be normal. So what is the reason for this chronic urtic area? Chronic urtic area pathogenesis is not very clear. The most uh, commonly re described reason is the mast cell activation. Actually, we have a mast cell which contains histamines inside. So when a trigger happens, for example, mosquito bite happens, it, ca it causes the release of histamines from the mast cells and we get a rash. What happens in chronic urtic area is there is some reason because of which the mast cells are inappropriately activated. Without any triggers, they will get activated and the histamine is released. The histamine release causes the symptoms. The most common trigger 
explained in chronic category is autoimmunity. This is because approximately 30 to 40 percent of the patients with chronic category they have some autoimmune antibodies. The autoimmune, what I want to tell you is here it is not it is not SLE or rheumatoid arthritis. They tend to have a lot of auto antibodies. For example, they tend to have antibodies against IgE itself. They will be having antibodies against IgE receptor itself. And they will be having some of the children with chronic category will be having ANA positivity. They are not having SLE. And some children also having antibodies against thyroid antigens itself. This suggests that chronic urticaria is an autoimmune phenomena which gives rise to a lot of antibodies. These antibodies goes and stimulates the mast cells. See, th this is a mast cell. These are all the histamines inside. Normally, the mast cells will be having the Ig receptors and the Ig. What happens in in chronic urticaria is this antibody is formed newly. That is, this IgG antibody is directed against the Ig receptor and the Ig. These antibodies are formed suddenly because of some unknown reasons. They go and bind to the IgE as well as the Ig receptors and causes the release of histamine from the mast cells, which causes the symptoms of wheels are, uh, uh, in case of chronic urticaria. Once the histamine is released, all the symptoms occur subsequently. So pathogenesis is autoimmune. So what are the investigations one should order? Because chronic urticaria comes more, uh, children with chronic urticaria comes more frequently to the hospital. Many times we are forced to do a lot of investigation. But actually speaking, this is usually not, uh, not due to any serious illness. And investigation should be limited to the base investigations. A baseline blood counts, liver function test, the thyroid profile is sufficient for chronic urticaria. No need to go for a detailed and un unnecessary investigations unless it really warrants based on the clinical situation. So another important point, what I want to highlight is food allergy. So most uh, patients believe is food allergy is the common reason for chronic urticaria. Is food allergy is the common reason for chronic urticaria? No, food allergy is not the chronic cause, not the cause of chronic urticaria. Food allergy can be a cause of acute urticaria. See, for example, when a child at six months, you give a milk, we get a rashes. It is because of milk, milk no problem. But when the same child takes milk for four or five years, after five years, Suddenly on one day, child get rashes. That day morning, child has taken milk. That does not mean that this is because of milk allergy. So food allergy is not a cause of chronic urticaria. It's a myth. So what about doing allergy testing? I told allergy testing is not required in acute urticaria. But when the urticaria is lasting for more than six months, we do allergy skin testing, which includes testing for aero allergens, for food allergens. Food allergens here, it tested because to tell to the patient that you are not allergic to this food because most of the patients will be avoiding a lot of food items, so their nutritional part is compromised. So by doing a food allergy testing here in these patients, you can tell negative testing is there, so you can take all normal foods like that. But the major problem of doing allergy testing in, in chronic urticaria patient is, we have to stop antihistamines for a week. Then only we can go for allergy testing, because allergy testing basically tests the histamine response. So, but many patients with chronic urticaria will require daily antihistamines, and sometimes it may not be possible to do allergy testing at this point of time also. Another important allergy testing which is done in case of children with chronic urticaria is autoimmune skin test. Here, we take the serum of patients and we, prepare, we introduce intradermally. Yeah, see, we introduce the serum intradermally and we'll look for the wheel. A normal response is, Usually, if I, uh, as the, the person has give, uh, give, uh, received his own serum, will not have any reaction. But children with chronic urticaria who have autoimmune phenomena, that is, they have autoantibodies, they will form a wheel at the site of injection. If they develop a wheel within 30 minutes of giving in, uh, autologous serum skin test, it suggests they have a positive autologous serum skin test and they have an uh, autoimmune phenomena responsible for their chronic urticaria. So, children. With chronic urticaria, can have thyroid antibodies, rheumatoid factor, and ANA positivity. The presence of and these antibodies does not mean treatment unless they have the symptoms of the disease. Unless you have symptom of thyroid disease, the presence of thyroid antibodies in a child with chronic urticaria does not require any thyroxine supplementation. And routine testing for all these antibodies are also not recommended in children with chronic urticaria. So coming to our case, we already discussed these two cases. This the left side is the child with chronic spontaneous urticaria, that is six weeks duration, 15 to 15 rashes, prolate is just present. On the right side, we have chronic spontaneous urticaria, right, uh, severe type. We went ahead and did allergy testing for both these patients. The left side child, 
this is the allergy skin testing. So saline, histamine, negative control, positive control. I check for common air allergens and food allergens. All are negative and this 18 is autologous serum skin test. So I check for air allergens, food allergens, autologous serum skin test. All are negative. Okay, coming to the right side child, we checked for all the things, all are negative. This is the autologous serum skin test, which is positive here. That is, she developed a wheel when her serum is introduced intradermally. So she has autoimmune phenomena responsible for her attic area. So coming to the next case. So far, I have discussed about only attic area patient. Here we have a six, four year old, she's a six year old girl presented to us with chronic attic area for almost two years. She also had recurrent bees. So this is a child who has two allergies. One is respiratory allergies as well as the cutaneous manifestation. So we went ahead and did the skin test. Saline, histamine, this is a uh, allergen panel. And this is the autologous serum skin test. If you could see the trigger for her is Previous case, we could see autologous serum skin test one and positive. Here, you could see autologous serum skin test is positive. In addition, she also has positive for one of the dust mite. So the trigger in this case of chronic urticaria area is two. One is autoimmune phenomena, which is responsible for her urticaria, area. And this dust mite is responsible for her bees. So doing an allergy skin testing in a child with chronic urticaria area sometimes will help us to identify what is the reason behind the, the symptom which a child is developing. Coming to the next case, case seven and case eight. Here we have a seven year old boy presented to us with recurrent episodes of lip swelling of three years. That is angioedema, which happens without any reason for three years duration. So when you give cetrazine and prednisone, here is, it responds within a day itself. There is no relationship to the food, no associated arctic area. There is no wheels, as a, only child get angioedema. There is no arctic area and no history of any allergic rhinitis or asthma. Coming to this child, a similar age group child, here also child gets recurrent episodes of only angioedema, no attic area, but there is no response to cetrazine. The left side child, angioedema, when you give cetrazine, child responds. Right side child, recurrent episodes of angioedema, you give cetrazine, child is not responding. So what is the diagnosis in both the cases? So to understand this, one should have a basic idea about angioedema. So whenever we deal with a child with angioedema, the first question one should ask is, is this angioedema is associated with wheels or not? When an angioedema is associated with skin wheels, then it is treatment is an investigation and treatment is very similar to our arctic area. You have to classify this as spontaneous inducible and investigate based on investigation and treat accordingly. Suppose if the angioedema is associated without, is, is, does not have any wheels, as in our case, the pre, both the cases we don't have a wheels then we have to classify it as histaminergic type of angioedema and bradykinin type of angioedema. Here the histaminergic type of angioedema, here the response will be there with the cetrazine, as in the case on the left side. When the, the bradykinin type, there will not be any associated response with the antihistamine. Suppose you see an only angioedema, you try with histamines, if it is responding, it is histaminergic type. If it is not responding, it is bradykinin type. The why the point is very important is, the common thing what we suspect with hereditary angioedema is a bradykinin type of angioedema, which usually do not respond with antihistamines as well as with your steroids. And the hereditary angioedema is of three types. The first type is the C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency will be there. The second type, it is a functional defect. The quantity may be normal, the function will be affected. The third type, you may have a normal C1 esterase inhibitor level, but there will be mutations in the, some other genes. So coming back to the case, the left side child respond is only angioedema, no wheels and respond to cetrazine. So here we are dealing with a child with histaminergic angioedema idiopathic type. The right side child, we have uh, angioedema without wheels, but child has no response to cetrazine or prednisolone. So we are dealing with the possible case of hereditary angioedema. So just to tell you briefly, whenever you are dealing with a child with arctic area alone, you should go for basic blood counts, ESR, CRP, and thyroid profile. If anything is required, you can go for allergy skin testing. And if investigations are warranted, thyroid profile and connective tissue workup can be included or else not routinely done. If there is associated angioedema is there, then the complement workup is very important. You have to go for C3, C4 level and C1 estrogen inhibitor, both qualitative and quantitative should be done. This is an outline for children presenting with arctic area with or without angioedema. So why we are more worried about chronic and uh, arctic area? This is because arctic area, I told uh, chronic arctic area lasting for more than six weeks is, uh, is fine. But once started, when it's going to end, nobody knows. Usually the ten tendency for resolution 
is like this. So approximately by one to two years of age, some around 50 to 70 percent of children will become all right. And another 20 percent will become all right by five years of age. But almost two to 10 percent of the children may tend to carry this autoimmune phenomena throughout their life. So they may have the arctic area throughout the life. So chronic arctic area is a problem which is not going to cause any mortality, but it causes significant affects a significantly called the quality of life. It affects the daily living. It affects the mental well-being. It affects the social functioning. It affects the schooling, sleeping, all the things that will be getting affected. So the chronic arctic area, if it's persists for a longer time, it affects the quality of life and it affects the child a lot. So it definitely needs a treatment. Treatment, what is the basic aim? Chronic arctic area, we are seeing children getting 50 wheels also. So what is the basic aim? What the, what the aim uh, of the pediatrician should be is complete resolution of the symptom as far as possible with minimal side effects of the medicines. As I already uh, told in an acute arctic area, the second generation antihistamines is a key drug for the treatment of chronic category also. Here, these are the second generation antihistamines which can be started the usual dose. And once the response is not there, then the problem starts. Usually we start antihistamines, the child become all right. And once you stop the problem, it will be persisting. So many times the pediatricians are left with dilemma whether we should add one more medicine. That is, cetirizine should be added with, 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 uh, with uh, fexofenadine or something like that. But in chronic arctic area, lots of studies have been done and they have proved very clearly that instead of adding one more antihistamine, you can updose the second generation antihistamine. This study clearly elaborates. You see the response with levocetrazine and fexofenadine combination, the response with levocetrazine, fexofenadine, as well as in three drug combination, and response with updosing, increasing the dose of single drug. So this updosing is recommended in chronic arctic area only where only four drugs as of now has been approved to escalate. Not all drugs, you can increase the dose to fourfold. Only fexofenadine, desloratidine, levocetrazine, and rubotidine. So you start with the usual dose, no response over a period of two weeks, then you are allowed to increase the dose to fourfold. So you have raised the dose to fourfold and still the response is not there, then one should consider either the cyclosporin or omalizumab. Cyclosporin is a wonderful drug. Omalizumab also is very helpful, but it's very costly drug. And uh, cost is around around 20,000 rupees for under 300 milligram injection itself. Availability is also difficult. Currently, omalizumab is not available in Indian scenario. These are the alternative medication one can use in uh, resource limited uh, settings. So this is a study where they used chronic arctic area in children with, with uh, chronic arctic area children, they are used uh, cyclosporin. Uh, here, if you could see, they have studied 46 children and uh, they have all these children, they have tried antihistamines, they have stepped up the dose, the dose of the antihistamine to four times and the response is not there and they have added cyclosporin. And if you could see all the children responded to cyclosporin and they become all right and few relapses they have observed. And in these relapses also, restarting of cyclosporin also helped. And the study concluded that the cyclosporin is safe and efficacy is very well documented here. No side effects has been documented. Not only this study, lots of studies is there. Whenever we use cyclosporin, we have to be more worried about nephrotoxicity and hypertension. So clinically, we have to monitor the children regularly for hypertension. And we have to monitor the serum cyclosporin levels. That is very important. And the serum creatinine levels. If you monitor carefully and use cyclosporin, it's a safe drug and it will help very, very well in inducing remission whenever a child presents with antihistamine refractory to uh, chronic arctic area refractory to antihistamines. So coming to the next drug, omalizumab. Omalizumab, it is a humanized monoclonal antibody. It is basically an IgG antibody directed against IgE. What it does is it, it goes to the circulation, it binds to the free IgE as well as to the Ig receptors and thereby it causes the remission of symptoms. It is usually recommended in children more than 12 years of age. Dose is 300 milligram given every monthly once with subcutaneous injection. Very important is you have to monitor the child for anaphylaxis, which is a rare side effect, but the child needs monitoring for this. What about Montelukas? A common tendency is when cetrazine or fexofenadine is not helping in chronic arctic area, we can add Montelukas, but it is not has a significant role in the management of arctic area. Similarly, short course of steroids can be given if arctic area goes uh, very uncontrolled situation, but we cannot use uh, steroids for longer duration in children. So to sum up, what is the thing that treatment wise? First, you start with second generation antihistamines like fexofenadine. If there is no response in two weeks, you can increase to four fold. 
dose, if still there is no response, consider either cyclosporin or omalizumab. This is the treatment guidelines followed universally all over the world. So which child, whether we can uh, see a lot of children present in chronic category, whether we can suspect which child will go for a severe disease. So the predictors of severe disease of chronic category, that is a prolonged duration or whenever child presents with severe disease, that is they have more than 50 levels at the time of presentation itself. Whenever they have autologous serum skin test positive, when they have associated angioedema as a presentation, when some children have both chronic spontaneous as well as chronic inducible urticaria. So coming to the case back again, this is the case three where we have a chronic spontaneous urticaria mild type. We checked for skin test. All report are negative. Allergy skin test is negative. Autologous serum skin test is negative. So this child, we started only hydrox fexofenadine. Fexof with this, the child responded very well and became all right. Now for follow up doing very well. Coming to the case four, this is the right side case, chronic spontaneous urticaria. She has uh, the symptom for three years. Her autologous serum skin test is positive. That is autoimmune phenomena there going on. So we started antihistamines at a usual dose, not responded, stepped up the dose, not responded. Then with cyclosporin, she is doing very well and stopped, I stopped cyclosporin and she's in remission. So this is the child I told already chronic urticaria with V's. Uh, uh, this child we started at uh, house dust mite avoidance measures and uh, we tried with cyclosporin. She has gone for remission. Again, she relapsed. We have gone for omalizumab. She responded. Actually, omalizumab should be given in children more than 12 years of age. But omalizumab with asthma, when asthma is there, we can use omalizumab in children even more than six years of age itself. So to sum up, urticaria is a common problem uh, which we encounter in our practice is characterized by either a wheel or angioedema or both. Acute urticaria is less than six weeks and chronic urticaria is more than six weeks. So acute articular vasculitis should be suspected whenever articular lesions are painful or palpable and they are lasting for more than 24 hours, which leaves a hyperpigmentation on disappearance. And when they have associated systemic symptoms such as fever, joint symptoms, etc. And chronic urticaria is urticaria which is lasting for more than six weeks. It can be spontaneous or induced based on the occurrence or presence or absence of triggers. Always when you have a child with chronic urticaria, try to assess the severity with UAS score as mild, moderate, severe. No need to do for extensive investigations. Allergy testing has a significant role is there in chronic urticaria. We do for aerologens, food allergens, and autologous serum skin test. Always start with second generation antihistamines. If response is not satisfactory, go for fourfold rise. And if still not responding, go for cyclosporin. And, and if uh, refractory cases, one can consider for omalizumab especially if there is autologous serum skin test positive. Thank you. Okay, so somebody has uh, asked a query, please mention, uh, discuss about uh, autologous serum skin test. See, uh, uh, actually chronic urticaria is basically because of autoimmune phenomena. So we have to either demonstrate the antibodies. Antibodies are of two types. One is antibodies against IgE, antibody itself or antibodies to the receptors by I, I, if you demonstrate that that is pathogenic but doing those antibody titers is, uh, is very costly and not available in india so to how to then uh, how to tell the patient whether they are having ig antibodies against ige uh, as well as against ig receptors that is the way of autologous serum skin test so instead of the documenting ig antibodies against ige and ig receptors we, if you do autologous serum skin test and we take our patient's own serum and give intradermally, if you get a wheel, it tells you they are having autologous, they have an antibody against IgE. That is a positive autoimmune phenomena is going on in this test. And uh, one more query is uh, what to do for tamoxifen induced urticaria in female patient with breast cancer? Uh, see, I, I am a pediatric allergy specialist. I don't have an experience with tamoxifen. I have uh, a patient only with clunarizin actually. Any drug induced urticaria, we have to stop the drug because it will recur. Whatever you use, you have to recur. But uh, general concept is unless you cannot have an alternative treatment available, if uh, then you have to go for desensitization. All these things is possible. But my knowledge is limited with tamoxifen in, uh, in older patients. So one more question, how to give cyclosporin and what is the dose? 
So cyclosporin is uh, available as uh, capsules, as 25 milligram capsules and 50 milligram capsules and 100 milligram capsule is available. So older children, we can use the capsules. Small children, actually one, one company has, uh, we have a syrup formulation is available. Dose is one to three mg per kg per day. We can use, uh, uh, we can use uh, cyclosporin. Um, very important is, uh, people are worried about cyclosporin, but uh, we, we always should be very careful about cyclosporin. Don't start cyclosporin and just leave it off. We have to monitor baseline, you document blood pressure, that is very important, and serially follow with blood pressure, serum creatinine, more important is cyclosporin levels. See, whenever, in my protocol is, whenever I step up the cyclosporin, whenever I step up the dose of cyclosporin levels, I always follow with cyclosporin levels and serum creatinine. So if you carefully monitor, it's a safe drug, you usually do not cause any side effects. So among uh, fexofenadin and uh, levocitrosin, which has more efficacy in chronic arthritis area. See, they have uh, st studied in detail and they have uh, uniformly agreed that there is no specific antihistamine. See, for example, give fexofenadin in chronic arthritis area, this is good. Give bilasin, this is good. All second generation antihistamines are uniformly safe and uniformly efficacious, efficacious in starting antihistamines. But when you're going for stepping up dose, I already told you four antihistamines. When you're going for stepping up dose, only you can step up with this four antihistamines. Either you can use cetrazine or you can use fexofenadine, you can use resloratadine or something like that. I have a good uh, experience with fexofenadine and with cetrazine also, uh, but there is no specific drug is uh, available in literature to tell that this is good over that. Use uh, the, my, my point is use preferentially second generation antihistamines. Please don't use hydroxyzine in the case management of either acute or chronic arthritis area because it causes a lot of drowsiness of the child and it affects the child's schooling as well as the sleep. Uh, can you elaborate on, on treatment for angioedema again, please? See, angioedema uh, is a separate topic. I can elaborate in detail, but uh, to briefly to tell you, the first question you see, you ask angioedema is drug-induced. See, I have not mentioned this because adults, the most common cause of angioedema is ACE inhibitors drug can cause angioedema. First, rule out the drug-induced cause of angioedema. If drug is not the reason for angioedema, next question is associated with wheels or not. If wheels is there, treat angioedema just like chronic arthritis. Give antihistamines, usual dose, not responding. Go for four-time dose, not responding. Use cyclosporin or omalizumab. If arthritis is responding, if sorry, if arthritis is not associated with wheels, that is, the patient gives a history. I am having only angioedema, no wheels. Angioedema comes lasts for a few days and then disappears. So in such a case, next question is, is your angioedema is responding to antihistamines or steroids or not? Suppose you come with angioedema, I give antihistamine and cetrazin, whether it disappears tomorrow itself. Yes, if it disappears, it is very, very, very less likely to be hereditary angioedema. It is more commonly because of histaminergic angioedema. Here also treatment is very much like chronic arthritis only. So uh, treatment for hereditary angioedema is quite different. That is a separate uh, topic we have to discuss in detail. Somebody is asking about, explain the pathogenesis of autoimmune phenomena in chronic arthritis area. Uh, so I'll take the slide again. What? See, uh, Pathogenesis, there is no clear-cut pathogenesis. The concept is people have clearly established that autoimmune phenomena is the clear, so far what mechanism they have explained is autoimmune mechanism is the clearly explained mechanism. Because the, the patients with chronic arthritis area have a lot of antibodies, autoantibodies in their, in their circulation. So you screen 100 children with chronic arthritis area, they will be definitely having antibodies against IgE, they will be having autoantibodies against Ig receptors. They will be having autoantibodies against serial antigens. And somebody will be having, even you do ANA positive. This ANA positive also does not mean like SLE. So they have a lot of autoantibodies auto is there. So autoimmune mechanism is the most common mechanism responsible for chronic arthritis area. So how the autoimmune, so because of some reasons, this red color antibodies are formed in children with, with, with chronic arthritis area. So these antibodies are formed are they actually against the normal Ig receptors as well as the normal Ig antibodies. So when they are in the circulation, for reasons unknown, they suddenly go and bind to the Ig antibodies and they go and bind to the Ig receptors without any specific trigger from outside. So no triggers, 
these on antibodies already there in the circulation of children with chronic urticaria goes and binds to the receptors as well as the IgE and then causes the release of release of histamine from the mast cells. Once histamine is released, child gets a lot of rashes. Once this settles down, child will become fine. Again, without any unknown reason, these antibodies goes and binds there and causes the release of histamine. So this is the most uh, very well described mechanism responsible for for, for uh, the chronic urticaria. Because autoimmune mechanism is responsible, we have a start, we are using also cyclosporin and omalizumab because omalizumab, nothing but it blocks the free Ig levels. It blocks the free Ig, this Ig as well as the Ig uh, receptors. So once this is blocked in omalizumab, there is no place for the autoantibodies goes going and binding. And cyclosporin, we all know it's an autoimmune, uh, auto, it is an autoimmune modulator. It reduces the formation of autoantibodies. So the child has a response. So this is the mechanism of pathogenesis in children with chronic urticaria. So role of histoglobe injection in children with chronic urticaria. Actually, there is no role, no role of uh, histoglobe injection. There is no recommendation in the literature for histoglobe injection for chronic urticaria. Uh, a role of a mechanism of uh, role of Ig testing for parents counseling. Uh, Ig see uh, in acute urticaria there is no role for Ig testing at all. There is no role for any investigations. In children presenting with chronic urticaria, yes, definitely there is a role of Ig testing. See the uh, for example a child who has an Ig level high in chronic urticaria, it tells you that this two three things. One is they may have for, suppose the child has an associated bees. This tells you that that uh, that bees is responsible for the high Ig one, and this child may be amenable to treatment to even to omalizumab. A high Ig level is not required to start omalizumab, but it predicts a good response with omalizumab. So the Ig level is just to tell the patient that they may be a, can, a, can, a candidate who may respond to omalizumab. That's all. It's not going to help you much in other ways. So is Belastin superior to Fexofenadine? I already explained there is no superiority of Belastin over Fexofenadine. After fourfold increase in histamine, the guideline says add Montelukast, but you say it has minimal role, kindly come on. See, if you go for international recommendations, there is no role for Montelukast. If you go for an Indian recommendation, which is published in 2017 in Indian Journal of Dermatology, it is a dermatological association which has recommended it. Uh, but no international guidelines recommended it. In my personal experience also, if you add mental cost, those children who are not responding will not help. Basically, this is because the re reason for chronic urticaria is because of autoimmune phenomena. The autoimmune phenomena cannot be controlled much by mental cost. It is not because of high Ig that chronic urticaria happens. It is not required to the allergy. It is basically an autoimmune phenomena. So role of mental cost is not much. If you want, you can see an RN drug, but recommendation says clearly that you try with four dose, four times load of four dose of antihistamines. Not responding, you should go for cyclosporin. Not responding, think of malizumab. So, role of steroids in children presenting with uh, antihistamine with uh, uh, sorry, uh, see acute urticaria child. If I am treating with antihistamines, not responding, when to give steroids? See, I told you many times it is because of uh, because of frustration we start steroids because child presented on day one started antihistamine comes back on day three again child tells you that this uh, uh, same problem so we are desperate to, to show some response we start steroids we, we all know that we start steroids immediately the child will become all right again the child comes back with a problem of urticaria once you stop the steroids this we commonly see so steroid per se in acute urticaria is recommended only if you have an angioedema. If you don't have an angioedema, steroid doesn't have a role. Give antihistamines. If you want, you can step up the antihistamine dose. Also, safety is there in children. And if it is acute urticaria, it will resolve. See, for example, a child presenting with one, two weeks of urticaria, one week of urticaria to me. See, I don't know whether this is an acute urticaria, chronic urticaria. So you treat as an acute urticaria. If the symptoms are not responding within a month and comes back again, we are going towards evolving chronic urticaria. We have to prime the patient. This is a chronic problem. We have to be very, very careful and we have to involve the allergy specialist and we have to treat accordingly. So adrenal injection to be given in acute urticaria. 
So uh, whenever whenever a child you are seeing an acute arctic area, unless there is evidence of anaphylaxis, there is no role of adrenal injection. Only indication is anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is not wheels. It is skin plus extra symptoms. See, when you have a skin symptom, in addition you have wheeze, then it is anaphylaxis possible. When you have a skin symptom with with uh, hypotension, then it is possible anaphylaxis. Then you should not hesitate. You should go for intramuscular use of adrenaline. See, uh, if a child with chronic urticaria goes into remission with cyclosporin again develops symptoms, uh, then when to start again cyclosporin? How long? Or use first antihistamines if not? See, this is uh, what I want to leave is you have to have a uh, see again restarting all sort individual basis. See, generally when you start cyclosporin, response is good. When response is good, you give cyclosporin and tapering is very important. You slow tapering and response is there, it's fine. Children who are not res responding to cyclosporin, restarting cyclosporin can be tried, but I suggest to go for omelizumab. If, if you are able to get omelizumab, go for omelizumab, you will get a good response. How long to use antihistamines uh, when child is not responding to antihistamines and when to start cyclosporin? See, you have to give an adequate trial of at least two weeks, uh, minimal trial of two weeks. Don't uh, go for cyclosporin very early because literature says almost 50% of the children uh, if you start uh, antihistamines and appropriate dose and you up, up dose the uh, increase the dose you have a good response so you wait for at least two to three weeks give a good response because once you start the cyclosporine you have to counsel the patient very clearly you have to do a lot of investigations monitoring and you're putting a child at, at a, 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 a drug and it requires a lot of monitoring so you can try for three weeks but what generally i feel i feel uh, i see in the practices children have been given for years antihistamines that is not required you can try for two to three weeks good dose not responding go for then go for cyclosporine so there is a role of role of tracrolimus in chronic arctic area there is a role of uh, tracrolimus in, uh, in chronic arctic area but it is it's not coming in the guidelines some uh, there is a uh, few studies have used tracrolimus and they have seen response but cyclosporine is the recommended drug in, in reference to chronic arctic area so uh, no need to do uh, is there a need to do ANA antithyroid antibodies and HPSH in chronic arterial? There is no need to do routinely ANA antithyroid antibodies and HPSH. See, for example, you see a child with chronic arterial. You see a girl child, 10 year old girl child. She has alopecia. She has on of fever or, or joint symptoms. Definitely, definitely you should go for ANA and uh, accordingly. You see a child obese girl who is putting on a lot of weight. And in such a case, you can do free T4 TSH. Routinely doing thyroid antibodies or ANA antibodies are not required. How many days we have to wait to start cyclosporin? See, uh, I already told you uh, at least you have to wait for a histamine response for antihistamine response for two weeks, two to three weeks. You could uh, give a good trial of two to three weeks. If response is not satisfactory, then you go for cyclosporin. If uh, there are no further queries, so I thank you uh, for an interactive session and uh, we will meet uh, shortly with. Uh, 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 similar sessions. Thank you very much.